But actually, more important than that, even if we build a feature and we transition it through to live, and the component's working, great, technology development done. What impact has that had on the business metrics? You know, has it been a success? So we have information that tells us very quickly whether or not a change has been good for the business as well. Whilst we've been reducing that transaction cost going from development, transitioning through to the live environment, once you've got that really fast, and the business starts to see opportunities for quick change, you can start building more and more and reduce the time it takes to get an idea, get it developed, get it live, has it made a positive impact on your business? You can start to incrementally change things and see how it works, get smaller and smaller features. It's really quite exciting. How are we doing for time? No, no. We've got another 10 minutes. If we need late, okay. Any questions? Um, it was kind of like the state of Agile. Um, so I, I kind of copied out all the other bits from the Agile Manifesto. The, the, we follow these principles. Um, the first one actually talks about continuous delivery. You know, and only sort of in the last couple of years has that become more of a buzzword. Um, there's, um, you know, Jez Humble's book is, has come out and it's, it's all about getting the ideas from the business quickly and getting them to market automating things, making it easy, all those, um, again, you talk about the stuff which is hard, people hide away from it, yeah? Don't hide away from it, attack it, make it automated, make it simple, yeah? If you don't, someone's gonna say, well, it's difficult, sometimes it goes wrong, we need to put process around it. And you can either go the route of having lots of process to protect you from it, or you can automate it away, make it repeatable, reliable, and easy. Any questions? Like, um, is that just in terms of like GUI changes, application changes, or can you push like back end database changes through that quickly as well? Okay, right now we can do the back end changes. The actual, the big, actually exciting customer facing website bit, it's gonna take a little bit more work before we can get continuous delivery working on there, okay? But we have, regular releases so we'll release changes every week um i, I think flickr uh, one of the sort of um idols of continuous delivery if you go to code.flickr.com it will actually tell you when flickr was last released um and uh, flickr have the developer pushes a button and their code goes to live and it'll tell you how many times it's released and who you actually have the photos of, of the people who released it up there um so that continuous delivery is really good, really easy. But if any delivery involves a database change, it suddenly gets a lot harder to do. And even Flickr, own, I've been told, only do a database change once a week. Okay, so there are things we're doing around that. Um, we uh, Rails is again a, another sort of popular framework that sort of encourages these things. It has migrations for databases. Um, we don't use Rails. We're a proper enterprise shop. <laughs> uh, we use a, a, a tool called Liquibase, which again is, is like that. It versions the schema. And as part of that delivery pipeline, um, when we do the deployment to a continuous test environment, the database changes will be deployed to, the, to that environment, to the databases associated with that environment. When I go to try and deploy those changes to the stable test environment, it will deploy the code, but I've got a script which says apply database changes and another script which says roll back database changes. Um, sometimes when you make a change to the database, it can be a simple schema change, but sometimes there's a big data migration that's got to happen as well, changing the shape of the data, which always works in development because you've only got like 100 records. Sometimes it takes a bit longer in a live environment. You've got 24 million rows in a, in a database or something. So 
you know, there's, there's a, there are still checkpoints that you have to have in place and understanding the change that's going on. I, it's interesting you, that thing you took about eschewing branches because it's becoming a problem for us and um, we, we keep talking about him being scared of it and thinking maybe we do, maybe we don't. Um, how easy was it to transition to just to, 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 to always having a life? I mean, also um, as well, we also did a ton of work on our deploy. Our deploy was about two minutes, now, yeah. um, which was a good feeling actually. Um, but it, it, I just want to, how did you make that transition? I mean, obviously it, it's a nice idea, but yeah, I, getting people to buy into it must have been quite hard. Yeah, um, you know, continuous integration isn't mentioned anywhere in the Agile Manifesto, but it's one of these sort of common practices and everyone thinks they're doing continuous integration, but they often have branches and that means you're separating stuff out as long as possible. So moving to one mainline development was um, a, an interesting task, I think I was maybe, was it autocratic in that one? Um, there, there was, there was some, some resistance uh, against that, but after doing it, one of the developers who, who told me, God, that's a crazy idea, it'll never work, uh, a couple of weeks later is going, actually, this is quite a good idea, I think it's going to be really good. Um, how did we do it? Well, we have a service-oriented ar architecture, lots of little components that have their own responsibilities. So that's quite easy. There's very rarely, because the concerns of each of those components is fairly specific, there's very rarely multiple changes going on in those components at the same time, if ever. So out of the 15, 20 different components that we have to build, it turns out there's only one or two of them that actually have any contention. And looking back at the history of all the source code, there were lots of branches there that had been developed and then kind of died off because the integration was going to be really difficult or the priorities had changed. So we'd started to move more to an agile company, starting to build smaller and smaller projects so the branches could be shorter lived, but there was still kind of like, particularly for the website, a period of time where if we want to release every week, you've got this time where you've, you've tested your code on your branch, you've got to integrate it into the main line, you've got to build it again, you've got to test it again. It feels really quite wasteful and expensive and you're not getting much from it. So we just said, we're gonna do mainline development. How do we do it? You know, how do we fix those bugs? Um, sometimes someone's checked something in and I've got the release to do and that's made it really unstable. Well, it's okay, I can go back to where it was last stable and release from there. So understanding how to do that. The other side of that is starting to build in switches so you can turn things on and off. But actually, the important thing with the switch, and again, you touched on it, once it's live and your new feature is turned on, get rid of the switch, go back and refactor, yeah? <laughs> Delete that code, please do. How big's your team? Because, uh, I mean, most of that we, we're so similar to, so... so uh, how your is was to get the you know, your little explosions on your line, but to get them closer. Vertical slices. So then it did happen, yeah. rather than working on a branch for um, bits in a line, we'd just go back to the trunk again and just either cancel what we'd started or, or, or wait till it had done and then, then fix the, the defects at the same time. Mm -hmm. We were quite hard, hard on the uh, what's called, but well, you might know that a uh, single piece of flow. So we get yeah. something and we do the smallest piece we could and then push that straight away to life. But I'm interested to know what what uh, size of team you've got. What size of team we've got? Um, uh, well, we're we're an agile business in another kind of way. <laughs> We have a lot of different demands coming in, changing priorities. So that's useful for us to try and break that, those components down to, uh, or the change down to small enough parts that we know we're going to be delivering something. At the moment, we've got four teams. I think by the ne end of next week, we'll have three teams. Uh, the teams vary in size between about three people and about eight or nine people. Um, so there's, you know, some of those projects are quite big and one of the things, although you know, so we've got different components with different responsibilities, we don't have, you're responsible for this component, you're responsible for this component, yeah? 
you're responsible for adding in this new feature which is going to deliver uh, something on the website. That feature means I need to change the basket process, it means I need to change the communication in the warehouse, I need to talk to a different courier, I'm going to develop that. At the same time, someone else is going to be optimising the same basket in a different way. So we do have two different teams working on exactly the same part of the code and all of them committing into the same branch and it, it works. But yeah, teams, three to, three to nine people with three teams. One last question. Right. So the teams that you're working with, you're generally following the principles set out by Bob Martin in his book. Agile patterns. Uh, so, dependency inversion principle, single responsibility, that kind of thing. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just curious, because quite a few people have been quite dismissive about the book, but actually I've used it for, for a couple of years. Um, I think it actually hits the mark. So it's just being able to design and develop software in a way that you can make very small, discrete changes and get regular feedback and get things out into the wilderness quite quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's great when you start off a company and everyone who starts off that company is, uh, is familiar with Agile and does it the right way. That's great, but you know, um, a lot of companies start off quite small with people having not, not caring so much about the software development, but actually what's the big business idea I can build? Oh, I can build this, I can build this, I can build this. And things grow organically and they grow very quickly. So we have a mixture of organically grown stuff and bits with dependency of, uh, what is it? Inversion of control, dependency injection in, and, and some bits are, uh, are, are scary to look at, but you know what, they work. And you know, other bits are built up test driven. The older bits, which are scary to look at, are really difficult to put unit tests into, but I can still isolate that component and put the business acceptance tests around it. So, you know, I can still know that I can change that. I might be more likely to break it. I don't get the feedback as quick that I've broken it, but we can still do that. Some of them are. Not all of them. There's a mixture. There's a ThoughtWorks conference tomorrow, where we're talking more about the architecture. If you can, if you're going there, you'll find out more. It's good, wasn't it? Thanks very much. Thank you.